Hello, my darlings. Mother Raven here. Please sit down, make yourself comfy. Have some of the snacks. The Year of the Big Thaw by Marion Zimmer Bradley. You say Matthew is your own son, Mr. Emmett? Yes, Reverend Doan, and a better boy never stepped if I do say as shouldn't. I've trusted him to drive team for me since he was 11, and you can't say more than that for a farm boy. Way back when he was a little shaver so high, when the war came on, he was bound he was going to go sail with this Admiral Fargot. You know boys that age like runaway colts. I couldn't see no good in his being cabin boy on some tarnation navy ship, and I told him so. If he wanted to sail out on a whaling ship, I low I'd have to let him go. But Marty, that's the boy's ma, took on so that Matt stayed home. Yes, he's a good boy and a good son. We'll miss him a powerful lot if he gets this scholarship thing. But I low it'll be good for the boy to get some learning besides what he's getting in school here. It's right kind of you, Reverend, to look over this application thing for me. Well, if he is your son, Mr. Emmett, why did you write birthplace unknown on the line here? Reverend Dunn, I'm glad you asked me that question. I've been turning it over in my mind and I just about come to a conclusion it wouldn't be no how fair to hold it back. I didn't lie when I said Matt was my son because he's been a good son to me and Marthy. But I'm not his pa and Marthy ain't his ma. So it could be I stretched a tooth just a mite. Reverend Doan, it's a tarn funny yarn, but I'll walk into the meeting house and swear to it on a stack of Bibles as thick as cordwood. You know I've been farming the old corning place these last seven years. It's good flat Connecticut bottom land, but it isn't like our land up in Hampshire where I was born and raised. My pa called it the Hampshire Grants, and all that was King's land when his pa came in there and started farming at the foot of Studdock Mountain. That engine for fires, folks say, because engines used to build fires up there in the spring for some of their heathen doodads. Anyhow, up there in the mountains, we see a tarn power of queer things. You call to mind the year we had the big thaw about 12 years before the war? You mind the blizzard that year? I heard tell it spread down most of York, and at Fort Orange, the place they call Albany now, the Hudson froze right over, so they say. But those York folk do a sight of exaggerating, I'm told. Anyhow, when the ice went out there, was an almighty good thaw all over. And when the snow run off Suttock Mountain, there's a good-sized hunk of farmland in our valley went underwater. The creek on my farm flowed over the banks, and there was a foot of water in the cow shed. And down the swimming hole in the back pasture was nothing but a big gully, fifty foot and more across, rushing through the pasture deep as a lake and brown as the old cow. You know, fresh at floods, full up with sticks and stones and old dead trees and somebody's old shed floating down the middle. And I swear to goodness, Parson, that stream was running along so fast, I saw four-inch cobblestones floating and bumping alongside. I tied the cow and the calf and Kate. She was our white mare. You mind, she went lame last year and I had to shoot her. But she was just a young mare then and skittish as all get out. But she was a good little mare. Anyhow, I tied the whole kit and caboodle of them in the woodshed up behind the house where they'd be dry. Then I started to get the milk pail. Right then I heard the gosh awful screech I ever heard in my life. It sounded like thunder and a freshet and a forest fire all at once. I dropped the milk pail as I heard Martha scream inside the house and I run outside. Martha was already there in the yard and she pointed up in the sky and yelled, Look up yander. We stood looking up at the sky over Shuddock Mountain, where there's a great big shooting now. I don't know as I can call its name, but it was like a trail of fire in the sky. And it was making the dangest racket you ever heard, Reverend. Looked kind of like one of them Fourth of July sky rockets. But it was big as a house. Martha was screaming and she was grabbing me and hollering, Hez, Hez, what in Tunket is it? 
And when Marthy cusses like that, Reverend, she don't know what she's saying. She's so scared. I was plum scared myself. I heard Liza. That's our young'un, Liza Grace, that got married to the Taylor boy. I heard her crying on the stoop. And she came flying out with her penny all black and hollering to Marthy that the pea soup was burning. Marthy let out another screech and ran for the house. That's a woman for you. So I quietened Liza down some, and I went in and I told Martha to weren't no more than one of them shooting stars. Then I went and did the milking. But you know, while we we're sitting down to supper, there came the most awful grinding, screeching, pounding crash I ever heard. Sounded if it were in the back pasture, but the house shook as if something had hit it. Marthy jumped a mile, and I never saw such a look on her face. Hez, what was that? she asked. Shoot now, nothing but fresh it, I told her. But she kept on about it. You reckon that shooting star fell in our back pasture, Hez? Well, now, I don't know. It did nothing like that, I told her. But she was jittery as an old hen. And it weren't like her no how. She said it sounded like trouble. And I finally quieted her down by saying I'd saddle Kate up and go have a look. I kind of thought, though I didn't tell Marthy, that somebody's house had floated away in the freshet and run aground in our back pasture. So I saddled up Kate and told Marthy to get some hot rum ready in case there was some poor old soul run aground back there. And I rode Kate back to the back pasture. It was mostly uphill because the top of the pasture is on high ground and it sloped down to the creek on the other side of the rise. Well, I reached the top of the hill and looked down. The creek were a regular river now, rushing along like Niagara. On the other side of it was a stand of timber, then the slope of the Shuttuck Mountain. And I saw right away the long streak where all the timber had been cut down out in a big scoop with roots standing up in the air and a big slide of rocks down to the water. It was still raining a mite and the ground was sloshy and squanchy underfoot. Kate scrunched her hooves and got real balky, not liking it a bit. When we got to the top of the pasture, she started to whine and wicker and stamp. And no matter how loud I woed, she kept up with stamping, and I was plumb scared she'd pitch me off in the mud. Then I just started to smell a funny smell, like something burning. They don't ask me how anything could burn in all that water, because I don't know. When we came up on the rise, I saw the contraption. Reverend, it was the most tarnal, crazy contraption I ever saw in my life. It was bigger nor my cow shed, and it was long and thin and as shiny as, as Marthy's old pewter pitcher her ma brought from England. It had a pair of red rods sticking out behind, and a crazy globe fitted up where the top ought to be. It was stuck in the mud, turned halfway over on the little slide of roots and rocks, and I could see what had happened all right. The thing must have been, now, Reverend, you can say what you like. But that thing must have flew across Shattuck and landed on the slopes and the trees, then turned over and slid down the hill. That must have been the crash we heard. The rods weren't just red, they were red hot. I could hear him sizzling as the rain hit him. In the middle of the infernal contraption, there was a door, and it hung all together as if every hinge on it had been wrenched half off. As I pushed old Kate alongside of it, I heard somebody holler and alongside the contraption. I didn't know how to get the words, but it must have been for help. Because when I looked down and there was a man a-flopping along in the water, he was a big fellow and he wasn't swimming, just thrashing and hollering. So I pulled off my coat and boots and hove in after him. The stream was running fast, but he was near the edge and I managed to catch on to an old tree root and hang on keeping his head out of the water till I got my feet aground. Then I hauled him onto the bank. Up above me, Kate was still winning and raising Ned as I shouted at her as I bent over the man. Well, Reverend, he sure did give me a surprise. Weren't no proper man I'd ever seen before. He was wearing some kind of red clothes, real shiny and sort of stretchy, and not wet from the water like you'd expect, but dry in it felt like that silk and Indian rubber stuff mixed together. And it was a bright red that, at first, I didn't see the blood on it. When I did, I knew he was a goner. His chest was all stove in, smashed to pieces. One of the old tree roots must have jabbed him as the current flung him down. I thought he were dead already, but he opened up his eyes. Funny color they were. Greeny-yellow. 
And I swear, Reverend, when he opened them eyes, I felt he was reading my mind. I thought maybe he might be one of them circus fellers in their flying contraptions that hang at the bottom of a balloon. He spoke to me in English, kind of choky and stiff. Not like Joe the Portuguese fa sailor, or like those carnal French, Frenchies up Kennedy way, but well, funny. He said, my baby in ship, get baby. He tried to say more, but his eyes went shut, and he moaned hard. I yelped, God Almighty, excuse me, Reverend, but I was so blame upset, that's just what I did say. God Almighty, man, you mean there's a baby in that there Dunford contraption? He just moaned, so after spreading my coat around the man a little, I just plunged in the river there again. Reverend, I heard tell once about some tomfool idiot going over Niagara in a barrel. And I tell you, that's just what it was like when I was trying to cross that freshet to reach a contraption. I went under and down and was whacked by floating sticks and whirled around in the freshet. But somehow, I don't know how, except by the pure grace of God, I got across that raging torrent and climb up to where that crazy ding for machine was sitting. Ship, he called it. It ain't worth ship. Reverend, it was some flying dragon kind of thing. It was a real scary looking thing. But I climbed up to the little door and hauled myself inside, and sure enough, there were other people in the cabin, only they were all dead. There was a lady and a man and some kind of animal looked like a bobcat, only smaller, with a funny shaped rooster comb thing on its head. They all, even the cat thing, was wearing those shiny stretchy clothes. And they all were so battered and smashed, I don't even bother to hunt for their heartbeats. I could see by looks they were dead as a doornail. Then I heard a funny little whimper, like a kitten, and then a little funny rubber cushiony thing. There's a little boy baby looking about six months old. He was howling lusty enough, and when I lifted him out of the cradle kind of thing, I saw why. That boy baby, he was wet and his little arm was twisted under him. That there flying contraption must have smashed down awful hard, but that rubber hammock was so soft and cushiony, all it did to him was jolt him good. I looked around, but I couldn't find anything to wrap him in, and the baby didn't have a stitch on him except a sort of spongy paper diaper. Wet as sin. So I finally lifted up the lady who had a long cape thing around her. I took the cape off real gentle. I knew she was dead, but she wouldn't be needing it. And that baby boy would catch his death if I took him out bare naked like that. She was probably the baby's ma. A right pretty woman, but she was smashed up something awful. Anyhow, to make a long story short, I got that baby boy back across that Niagara Falls somehow and I laid him down by his paw. The man opened his eyes kind and said in a choky voice, Take care, baby. I told him I would, and I said I'd try to get him up to the house where Marthy could doctor him. The man told me not to bother. I dying, he says. We come from planet star up there. Crash here. His voice trailed off into a language I couldn't understand, and he looked like he was praying. I bent over him and held his head on my knees real easy, and I said, don't worry, mister. I'll take care of your little fellow till your folks come after him. Poor God, I will. So the man closed his eyes and I said, Our Father, which art in heaven. And when I got through, he was dead. I got him up on Kate, but he was cruel heavy for all. He was just a tall, skinny fella. Then I wrapped that there baby up in the Cape thing and took him home to give him to Marthy. And the next day I buried the fellow in the South Meadow. And the next meeting day we had the baby baptism. Matthew Daniel Emmett, and brung him up just like our own kids, that's all. All, oh, Mr. Emmett, didn't you ever find out where that ship really came from? Why, well, Reverend, he said it come from a star. Dying men don't lie, you know that. I asked the teacher about them planets he mentioned. She says that one of them planets, can't rightly remember the name, March or Mark or something like that. She says some pretty big scientist feller with the telescope. Saw canals on that planet, and they'd have to be pretty near as big as this here Erie Canal to see him so far off. 
And if they could build canals on that planet, I don't know why they couldn't build the flying machine. I went back the next day when the water was down a little to see if I couldn't get the rest of them folks and bury them. But the flying machine had broke up and washed down the creek. Martha still got the cape thing. She's a powerful saving woman. We never did tell Matt, though. Might make him feel funny to think he really didn't belong to us. But, but Mr. Emmett, didn't anybody ask questions about the baby? Where you got it? Well, now, although they were curious, because Martha hadn't been in the family way, and they knew it. But up here, folks mind their own business pretty well, and I just let them wonder. I told Liza Grace I found her new little brother in the back pasture, and of course it was the truth. When Liza Grace growed up, she thought it was just one of those yarns old folks tell little shavers. Has Matthew shown any difference from the other children that you can see? Well, Reverend, not so that you could notice it. He's powerful smart, but his real pa and ma must have been right smart too to build a flying contraption that could come so far. Of course, when he was about 12 years old, he started reading folks' mind, which didn't seem exactly right. He'd tell Marthy what I was thinking and things like that. He was just at the pesky age. Liza Grace and Minnie were both courting then, and he'd drive away their boyfriends, telling them what Liza Grace and Minnie were thinking and teasing the gals by telling them what the boys were thinking about. They weren't no harm in the boy, though. It was all teasing. But it just weren't decent somehow, so I took him out behind the woodshed, and I give his britches a good dusting just to remind him that that kind of thing weren't polite nohow. And Reverend Doan, he ain't never done it since. Well, my darlings, I hope you enjoyed this little tale. And I will see you next time, my darlings. So quoth this raven.